Welcome, everybody. Um, this is How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love Failover, a Peter Sellers themed talk uh, I, uh, about, about the clicker not working. Here we go. About fully automated high availability for Postgres. So if you're confused by the title of the talk and you aren't here for fully automated high availability, then now's the time to leave. Uh, otherwise, you can hang out. So um, obviously, with everybody doing cloud deployments and everything else and wanting to sleep through the night, we want Postgres to go full auto. Um, and while there are a lot of big, heavy things that are full auto, what we really want is a sort of kinder, gentler automation. I, something which is easy to use, easy to deploy, and developer friendly. Fortunately, that's now possible. Uh, now, most of what I'm going to show you represents a lot of yak shaving that I did on my way to solve a different problem, um, because that's how you get into these things. Um, and as a result, um, I'm going to be basically showing you some technologies rather than a package solution. Um, I, also because everybody's got a different technical infrastructure and you want to integrate it with the inter infrastructure you have. So um, let's start with the demo. Um, first, I'm going to actually apologize. This will not be the, comp I can show you the failover and stuff. There are a couple parts of the demo that aren't working, mostly because I've been working on this demo cluster back in my office. Um, which is not on the road with me for this particular trip. It's actually a cluster of minnow boards running Kubernetes cluster. Um, and when I started back up my old AWS cluster last night, I managed to screw it up and only fixed it this morning. Um, so there's one component that's still not working. But the core failover is working, and I can show it to you. So um, this is our, here's a little admin interface for our Kubernetes cluster. Um, we've got three machines in the cluster, um, I, you know, with uh, a PostgreSQL service, a um, bunch of containers. I've actually got a couple of other things running on here uh, that we're running for demo purposes. Um, and uh, here's you know our machines. This is running on Fedora Atomic Host, which is a container uh, operating system uh, from Red Hat. It's what I actually work on for my day job. Oh, right. Good point. Um, so that does the whole room. Hold on. How do I do just... Wait. Wait, did that work? It worked. Yay! Okay. Um, so I... Okay, so I've got some tabs open here. The machine I'm on right now is the Kubernetes Controller Master. So uh, Kubernetes is a... Is a uh, is a master orchestrator system where you have one or more nodes that are orchestrators and those deploy containers to the other nodes in your cluster. So here we have the Kubernetes controller master and here we have three different machines that are workers that run things. Um, So we've got our PostgreSQL service running here, and a PostgreSQL service in Kubernetes is an address that you can actually connect to, and this address is backed by one or more pods, and pods are groups of containers. Oop, not Kubernetes, Kube Control. So like here's the pods, and these ones in the middle right here um, these Petroni ones are the PostgreSQL pods, and I'll explain in a minute what Petroni is. But so we've got a three node cluster running. So let's actually look at what's in that three node cluster. So uh, this is the output from one of the three PostgreSQL nodes. Um, we're getting feedback from Petroni telling us whose role this is. Um, so it can say, hey, um, I'm a secondary and I'm following a leader. So this is a replica. Uh, so, no, it's not the one I wanted.
Okay, and here's our leader. Um, lock owner, no action, I'm the leader with the lock. The, um, another way to see that is, um, and I'll show you more detail of this later on, but since everybody's actually storing their uh, replication metadata in etcd, I can take a look, yeah, let's shrink that a little bit. I can take a look at the JSON information for the different nodes. So um, we've got a bunch of JSON metadata and it's telling us what the different nodes are um, and what their configuration is and we have a replica, a replica, and then our master down here on the different pods. So the whole point of this is to do high availability. So let's look at, so this is not our leader. Um, this is our leader. So obviously the question is, what happens when we kill off the leader? Um, now, because I had so much in the issues messing with this demo cluster, I'm not going to do what I was going to do, which is to actually kill the EC2 instance. Um, instead, I'm just going to kill the Docker container. Let's see. Oop. Where are we here? There we are. So I've deleted the Docker container. And so then let's look what happened on the replica. So the replica noticed that the master was gone. Um, it acquired the master lock from the distributed configuration system. And it promoted itself to being a read-write replica. So we now have a new master. And it happened in about, you know, two, three seconds. So that is our initial demo. So let's talk about how all of that worked um, and talk about a little bit of history here. So Postgres replication is a single master system, right? Um, and the nice thing about single master systems is they're easy to understand and they're very reliable. The drawback to single master systems is availability is hard, right? Whenever you lose the master, you lose ability to write until you promote a new master. Um, and historically, the world of Postgres has had extremely manual high availability solutions. That is, the, the, the standard recommended thing in the PostgreSQL docs is go in and run PG SQL, PG control, promote. I don't like that because for me that means getting up at 3 in the morning because my phone rang. Also, the involved lag time in replication failover there is rather high. Um, now, obviously, the solution that a lot of people go for this is multi-master. Um, someday, PostgreSQL will get there. <laughs> but I'm not holding my breath. Now, the shame of this is that PostgreSQL binary replication as a backend is really bulletproof. It like just works. It has all kinds of detection stuff to prevent you from corrupting your data or replicating from the wrong master or doing anything stupid except maybe creating a ring replication thing, but um, that's maybe a feature, not a bug, um, and can be combined with various disaster recovery things. And so we really want to be able to use the PostgreSQL replication cluster because we know we can, PostgreSQL binary replication, because we know we can rely on it. So given that we have all these features in binary replication, why is automated failover not already a thing? Like why is, why is that not like a core Postgres feature? Um, and this is something I get asked all the time when I go to events that are not Postgres events. And the problem is that our answer for this is really bad. Um, this is actually quoting somebody who I won't name, who I overheard um, at a Postgres event when some new user asked them about this. And they literally said, automated failover is too complicated, you don't want it. But they do want it. And as a matter of fact, in a lot of cases, they may need it. This is not the right answer. Just because something is hard doesn't mean that it's impossible. And frankly, we do a lot of hard things in the world of Postgres. Um, uh, things that are hard to even describe what we did, except that Postgres is faster now. <laughs> also, 
One of the other things is we make the problem harder for ourselves than it needs to be, which is that having an automated failover solution that satisfies all users everywhere is pretty close to impossible. But having an automated failover solution that satisfies most users most of the time is actually not that hard. So um, the demo that I showed you implements something I call the 80% solution, which actually has two variations. It's actually basically sort of two 40% solutions. And I'll be talking about the other 40% later on. But basically, we have a pool of async replicas. We assume that nodes are cheap and replaceable. Um, for that reason, we're using containers. We have some kind of watchdog service. We auto-promote one replica. The other nodes remaster off of that replica. And then we update the application routing to the database in order to make sure that it can connect. And that basically covers that sort of sequence um, with one minor variation covers like 80% of what everybody needs from auto failover. And frankly, the other 20% often need very specialized things that will never be implementable through a common approach. Now, little, yeah? Uh, so this is the deal where you promote the furthest ahead replica. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, yes, uh, his, his comment was, this is the one where you just promote the furthest ahead replica. And my answer was yes. Yeah, you detect which one is the furthest ahead in the replication stream, and you promote that one. Now, a little history. Uh, my first crack at this was a project called HandyRap, um, uh, which I worked on with my coworkers at Postgres Experts. And the idea of HandyRap was it was a master controller architecture based on Python Fabric and SSH. Um, it's used in production in a couple of places. Um, it was designed to work with any PostgreSQL configuration or installation that anybody had because we had to retrofit it onto existing clients' infrastructure without being able to change how they'd installed or configured or deployed Postgres. Um, and in order to support all this, it was designed to be highly pluggable. It's still out there. You can download it. It works. Um, but had a problem. We designed it to work with anybody's PostgreSQL configuration anywhere. And that means that we have too many generals here. <laughs> And the result was the basic installation experience was call Postgres experts. Because I think at the end it had 140 configuration variables, plus more if you added certain plugins. Um, didn't scale all that well. And the handy rep server itself was a single point of failure because we couldn't do automated failover for that without risking split brain. Um, so, um, there was also another problem with it, um, which is we had this telephone game problem. So if everybody's seen the movie, you remember how it is that the nuclear bombs actually get launched, right? Is that they call in the codes, and then later on they try to call off the nuclear attack, only they lose the connection to one um, ICBM center. Um, the, um, and this is the problem that you have with any master controller architecture, which is that between the time that the master sends a command to the individual node and the time the node executes that command, you can have a loss of communication. And so as a result, HandyRep had four times as much code to deal with recovering from a loss of synchronization of the nodes as it did to actually do the failover. So, we realized that actually one of the things that I had to do to solve this was need to make sure that if the controller shuts down, that is, if the replication controller, the thing that manages what cluster you're part of and where, what direction you're replicating in, if that shuts down, so does PostgreSQL. So that you, can, you never have to deal with synchronization because you always know it's synchronized because otherwise Postgres is down. So we'll get to how we solve that in a minute. In the meantime, another company, Zalando, um, number one European online fashion portal, some 15 million customers, 150 databases, et cetera. With, with that many databases deployed, they needed to have automated HA. It wasn't like a nice to have thing. It was an essential to have thing. And so, but they tried to implement it again on their own in the first run and they ran into all of these failover failures things. They had something based on PG pool and they had all kinds of false failover and misfires and race conditions. Um, and of course, the biggest problem, which is split brain. Right here, we have two masters. 
um, and the um, you know where and split brain is sort of for a single master database split brain is your worst failure condition right which is um, once you have split brain automated recovery is not possible um, and manual recovery is not fast so it's the endpoint that you want to avoid um, even to the exclusion of, of like maybe being unavailable so um, they started working on this project called Petroni. So we're going to talk about, about Petroni, um, as our painter would say. So where Petroni started was a startup supplying platform as a service called Compose, which was later acquired by I, IBM, published a paper and a demo GitHub repo based on how they were doing Postgres as a service um, using something called Governor. And Governor was based on two realizations by them. Number one, your Postgres cluster is a very poor place to store the replication state for that same cluster. Because if the cluster becomes incoherent, then you also don't have a good source of information for the replication state. Second thing was that they realized that having a smart agent that is intelligent logic on each individual node beat out having a top-down controller for all sorts of reasons. And so based on that, they created this composed governor thing that was based on a containerized-based application backed by ETCD-based consensus and a simple Postgres con PostgreSQL controller. Again, I'll go more into what that means. Um, so Zolando forked this into the Petroni project, which I also immediately started contributing to um, because I needed it at the same time. So here's the basic idea. There are three parts to failover. One is noticing that you failed, noticing that the master has failed. The second part is failing over the database. And the third part is making sure that nobody can connect to the old master. So, and the way we handle a lot of those things is via the Petroni controller. So if you go to the Petroni website, Zolando, slash GitHub, Zolando, Petroni, have the URL later. Um, I see a bunch of Python code there. That Python code is not a separate service that runs somewhere. That runs on each individual Postgres node. It's a Python daemon. It runs in the container as the PID1, as the service of that container. And it starts and stops and reconfigures Postgres. This is where having Postgres in container benefits us. Because if we have Postgres on a regular server system, we can't really guarantee, you can do some stuff with systemd, but it's a lot harder to guarantee that if Petroni isn't running, neither is Postgres. Within a container, it's really easy to guarantee that. Because what happens is if Petroni shuts down, the container shuts down, which means Postgres shuts down. Um, it also provides an internal REST API because we need to be able to communicate with the Petroni controllers. Um, and it enforces an opinionated configuration of PostgreSQL. That is, you do not configure PostgreSQL, Petroni configures it for you. And that allows us to eliminate a whole bunch of issues that require us to have special cases in the replication controller system. <clears throat> so here's how failover goes. So we have right here, we have an individual Postgres container with our Petroni controller. Um, now, in my demo, I'm using Kubernetes as an orchestrator. So Kubernetes knows about this config, and it deploys multiple nodes um, via what's called a replication controller or a replication set. Um, so it's deploying, in this case, three nodes, right? Um, and after it deploys those three nodes, those three nodes communicate with ETCD. And they all try to grab the master lock from ETCD. Now, ETCD is a distributed configuration store, and one of the features it has is leader election. Um, so only one of those three is going to get that lock, largely timing-based. Um, so what happens is one of them gets that lock, and that one initializes itself as the master. This is in a brand new deployment, so that one initializes itself as the master. And the other two realize they're followers, and they start replication from the master. Now, the question is, what happens when something happens to the master? Well, when the master goes away, the master has been maintaining a key on ETCD. 
And if it doesn't constantly update, if it doesn't frequently update that key, it goes away. So when the key goes away, the other replicas notice this. And then they both try to grab the master lock. Um, there's actually a complicated, a two-stage election process. First one of them grabs the master lock, then we check what their replication replay point is across the cluster, because we want to promote the furthest ahead replica in order to avoid having replicas that can't remaster. Um, there is actually PG Rewind support for later versions of Postgres in Petroni if you want to do more complicated things. Not gonna, gonna go in depth into that here. So one of them becomes the master, the other one's still a replica, and replication starts up. In the meantime, Kubernetes has noticed that we're supposed to have three nodes and we only have two. So what Kubernetes does is it spawns another node. This node starts up, immediately communicates with the distributed configuration store, says, oh, I'm, there's already a master, so therefore I'm supposed to be a replica, and I'm gonna start replicating from the existing master. The lovely thing about this is it translates very easily into auto-scaling. I can spin up any number of nodes, and as long as I tell them which cluster they're supposed to be part of, they will automatically do the right thing. So the question is, how do we prevent split brain? Right? Because we went over all this. How do we split, prevent split brain? Well, in this case, we are relying on the distributed configuration stores. Now, given that we've already had three different talks that covered consensus algorithms at this conference, I'm not going to go over this. Um, if a few of you weren't in any of those talks, you know, just, I don't know, go back through the video or something. But the distributed configuration stores have ways to prevent split brain. So if we rely on keys and locks in the distributed configuration store, we can be reasonably assured that every Postgres node will either be part of the valid cluster or will not be part of any cluster. And if it's not part of any cluster, what Petroni does is it restarts the individual node in read-only mode, if it was a master, um, so that we don't end up with split rights. Um, now, there are some alternatives in the DCS world. Um, Zookeeper, uh, the big Java one, is supposed to scale larger. It's a little bit more complicated to configure um, than ETCD. Um, console, um, uh, the one from HashiCorp, um, does better geographic distribution, um, has some other nice features. We just haven't implemented support in Petroni for it because it's on the to-do list. Um, somebody introduced PG Paxos here, and it would be kind of amusing to do a PostgreSQL consensus cluster that you could hit from uh, the other one just, just to do it. Um, now, Petroni is a component, right? Like I said, Petroni is the daemon that runs on each node. The rest of the system can be a variety of different things. For um, Zalando, they are heavy into AWS stack. And so they have this project called Spilo that takes all the AWS things, you know, Route 54 and um, uh, what's the general cloud deployment thing for AWS? CloudFormation. CloudFormation, thank you. Um, building that on top of Petroni and each individual node in order to have a fully automated system. Um, I'm more, I'm, I work on the Kubernetes stack um, as part of my job, and so I have a little demo project that I'm going to be continually improving um, that I called Atomic DB, which is based on the Kubernetes orchestrator stack. So Postgres, Petroni, running on Fedora Atomic Host, uh, with Kubernetes, um, dynamic proxy and development, by the way, that's the part that's not working in the demo currently, um, and the cockpit UI. Um, so, um, oh, I'm actually a little ahead. Any questions before I go back to the demo? Yes? The new, the new node initializes itself. You deploy a new node, and the orchestration system passes the necessary configuration. That is, what cluster am I part of in any login secrets. Um, actually, let me show that to you. Where does it get the data? I, in the simplest configuration, it uses PG-based backup. Um, the um, Petroni does pluggably support other methods. Like, I know that actually within Spilo, Zalando is using Restore from S3 to provision the new nodes. Um, instead of using PG-based backup. 
But basically, any way that you could legitimately start a Postgres replica, you can also start it you know, here. If you're running it on ZFS, you could probably use a ZFS clone if you wanted to, um, you know, whatever. So yeah, but it does it on a pull model. That is, the individual new node you're deploying um, decides, you know, consults its code and configuration and decides how to get the data. Um, so we've got the leader here. So actually, let's look at some stuff, and I'll actually show you some of the setup. So this isn't our Kubernetes config. This is our basic sort of service. The service is just an endpoint that lets us connect to Postgres. Um, uh, and we have um, uh, you know, a selector here. Um, And here's the more complicated part that actually defines the node. But it's really actually not, it's a bunch of sort of metadata. Um, basically, um, but basically all we're doing is we're telling it to pull down this container that I built called Petroni Atomic. Um, and the Petroni Atomic container is just configured to do the right thing based on these environment variables. Now obviously in, under real production circumstances, things like those passwords would be passed via secrets, not as environment variables. Um, the um, and uh, you know and we've got some other things here like we need to know how to connect to the distributed configuration store and we need to know which cluster we are part of because um, the idea is that the same system should be able to support multiple Postgres replication clusters running in the same pool of servers. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. So so for example, if I wanted to add new nodes. Uh, So here, let's do this to the graphical interface. Come on. The, um, so let's see if I can actually find the replication controller for this. No, that's the Redis one. Here we go. Here's the Petroni one. So let's have five post quizzes. So now I've got five Petroni nodes, not, not ones you'd want to run in a three system, service system cluster, of course, um, because this means that we now have two running on two of the nodes, which is not particularly useful from an availability standpoint. Um, the, um, now there's a couple of other sort of interesting quirks of this, because for example, uh, Well, actually, I'll show you that in a minute. Let's see, so which one was that? Okay, should we kill the leader again? Well, first, let's actually follow one of the replicas, yeah? For e. Yep, okay, so there's there is one of the replicas. And here is the leader. And by the way, the reason why I'm removing this um, as part of my sort of kill simulation is that. If I just stop the container, the first thing Kubernetes tries to do is to restart it, if it's still there on the system. Because it's assuming that there's just been a blip you know, with the, the process management, not that it's actually dead. 
Um, so I'm removing it so it can't restart it. And so in the meantime, what happened to the other replica is, so in this case, this replica did not successfully grab it. Um, but here we are. Following new leader after trying and failing to obtain lock. So it remastered against whoever got the new lock. And I'd have to actually pull the five containers to figure out which one is the current master on that. Well, actually, no, I don't have to pull it because I can look at it through the metadata. Oop. At some point, we would love to have somebody contribute an actual UI for this. I've been actually adding an extension to Cockpit for it, but it's not done yet. Because um, weeding through all this JSON is not particularly user friendly. Um, so that's sort of our failover thing. And then in the case of, now one of the things that comes built in with Kubernetes is a simple load balancer. So in order to make a read-only connection, um, what I would do is connect to the service address. See what I got. So this is a replica. Yeah, second try I got the master. Um, the um, so this is just going to round robin those various backends. So that's great for the read load balance read only connections. Um, if you're doing high performance, you'll want to actually use an external load balancer like set up NGINX or or HA proxy or something to do. Slightly better load balancing. Um, the uh, did you go back to the slides? So, and I'll talk a little bit more about proxying in just a second. Now, let's talk about some alternatives. I did say that this wasn't really the eighty percent solution; it was the forty percent solution. So, here's the other forty percent. So, there's this project, uh, this this uh, platform as a service called Flynn.io that again uses Postgres as a database backend. Um, and Flynn decided to implement a slightly different HA, um, which is a descendant of the Manatee and or Yoke projects, which are also existing projects. Again, this production code, um, like Zolando, they are running this as their high availability in production. And their focus was not necessarily scalability and availability, but preventing ever losing data from the Postgres service. Um, this also depends on ZFS for part of its operation, just in case it's an issue for you. Let me explain how that works. Every time they set up a Postgres instance, that's actually three separate containers that are running on three separate systems. Um, one is a master, one is a synchronous replica, and one is an asynchronous replica. And again, they do this through smart agents running on each one. That is, the master you know, it connects, it sees there is no master for that particular endpoint, um, and it makes itself the master. Another one connects, it sees that there is a master, but there's no synchronous replica, and it makes itself the synchronous replica. Then another one connects, it sees there is a synchronous replica, and it makes itself the asynchronous replica. Um, they actually have a custom, and the reason why I promote Flynn over Manatee and Yoke is that Flynn implemented their own custom router in Go called Discover D, um, which is fairly nice and something I may lift from their project for Petroni. Um, so what happens is if you lose the master, um, the synchronous replica gets promoted to being the master, and the asynchronous replica gets promoted to being a synchronous replica. And at that point, hopefully your orchestration system notices that you need to have one more node. It creates a new node, which then creates itself as an asynchronous replica. Um, the idea behind this is that they can fail over with imputiny because there's going to be no data loss. Um, and 
if their goal is to make sure that with the failures of machines, there is no data loss for sort of single endpoint Postgres, then it does that really well. So basically, the reason why it's the 40% solutions, it depends on what your use case is, right? Flynn is about maximum data protection. It would be like the CP out of CAP. And Petroni is for maximum availability, which would be more like um, an AP out of CAP. Um, so it really depends on whether you're more concerned with availability and scalability or whether you're more concerned with guaranteeing that you don't lose any data. Um, I can even imagine setups where you would have both running side by side. There are some other alternatives. Um, Stolen is uh, Petroni rewritten in Go. It's not quite complete. Um, the original Compose.io is out there. Manatee, if you happen to be on the joint platform for some reason, um, it would be what you would use. Um, Nanopack Yoke is a sort of demo thing um, along the same lines as Flynn. Now, one thing that I am still tinkering with on the Petroni side of things is the proxy problem. Because you notice, I showed you the read-only built-in connection to do read-only connections. Well, the question is, what about the read-write connection? Um, this is still kind of under development, WIP here. Um, because the master service needs to follow failover. It needs to read the Petroni metadata and follow the master. Um, now, this has had me involved in development in Kubernetes, um, a feature called PetSet that's going to be a core feature for Kubernetes 1.3, which will be out around the same time as Postgres 9.6. Um, uh, and that would allow me to manage persistent endpoints for um, a headless service, which you can't currently do reliably. You can kind of do it via hack. Because I would like to use Kubernetes built-in load balancer to handle this. Um, right now, what we have is a little sort of hackish thing that runs a PG bouncer container, and that PG bouncer container pulls etcd and updates its configuration periodically um, in order to direct you to the master. The drawback to this um, is that PG Bouncer does not effectively do live failover. That is, while I can add the new master to the configuration and new connections will connect to that, old, that new master, I can't forcibly terminate connections to the old master except by restarting PG Bouncer. Um, we were talking actually over the pub about some solutions for this, um, whether it is implementing a new tool um, or making changes to PG Bouncer. Um, and also, Kubernetes 1.3 will solve some of these problems as far as I'm concerned. Uh, there are a whole bunch more features to Petroni, because, mostly because Zolando has continued developing the heck out of it. PG Rewind support if you're using Postgres 9.4 or higher. Uh, configurable node imaging, some synchronous replication support, although it's a little wonky. Um, you can have some replicas designated as failover replicas, and other ones designated as non-failover replicas. That was one of my features. Um, uh, cascading replication support is under development. Console support I kind of stubbed out, and it's not really complete. Um, and obviously, when BDR gets merged in, we'll want to actually have some support for that. And, and anybody and everybody is welcome to contribute, please, um, because there's a huge to-do list. Um, so here's links for some of the stuff. Um, I'll be continuing to build out the Atomic DB demo with a lot of the Kubernetes 1.3 stuff. Um, so take a quick look at it now and take a bigger look at it in about, you know, a month and a half, two months, because um, it will be a much more complete example configuration. Um, and for that matter, if anybody here is going to be at Red Hat Summit or, or DockerCon, I'm going to have that little micro cluster with me. And, and I'll be demonstrating failover by pulling power cords. So, um, so questions? Um, no. Yep. The que oh, sorry, yes. I'm sorry, I have to repeat the question. The question was, um, have you thought of using this to upgrade Postgres? And my answer to that was no. Um, the, um, once PG Logical is complete, then I could see a way to do that. Uh, but right now, I really can't see a way to do that that would not be highly manual. Um, so going forward, are you at Red Hat going to be running ports or are you just going to like... Okay. 
So the question was, am I going to have a Petroni fork or am I going to compete to the main one? Um, I do have my own fork, but it's just for, the, just for the reason of submitting pull requests. I see no reason to continue working on the official Zolando Petroni repository because my stuff gets, my pull requests get accepted. So I don't see any reason to maintain a fork. Um, the, um, so that is the place to go is the Zolando one. Um, all of my Red Hat stuff will be separate from that. It'll be like the Atomic DB stuff and it'll be all the orchestration stuff. But it doesn't require me to change Petroni itself. More questions? So what, what are the performance characteristics of some of our folks that you decide of the containerized side? Okay. So the question was, what's the performance characteristics of running Postgres inside a containerized environment? And my answer is, if you set it up correctly, it is no different from running it on the base system. Um, a container is just really basically a cheroot on steroids. And so you're using the base system. Now, in the demo config that you will see in my GitHub repo right now, I do not have persistent volumes set up. And so I'm using the in-container um, layered file system. And the performance characteristics of that, if you actually did that, would be quite bad. But that's not how you'd run it in production. You would actually have a volume that mapped to a volume on the host system. And then at that point, it's really no different from running it on the host. So the question was, is the distributed configuration store a single point of failure? Um, no, because that's why it's a distributed configuration store. Um, I mean, the idea with the ETCD is that I'm running you know, at least five nodes, maybe seven or eight. Um, that would be a reason for you to look at Zookeeper or Council because they have better built-in support for having multiple regions. Um, so you could actually have some of your nodes in a different data center and have some sort of intelligent failover to that. Um, that is, by the way, a roadmap feature for ETCD as well. So that will be in a future version of ETCD. Um, so yeah, that's the whole idea of having a distributed configuration store is that it, it, you never, it never runs as a single point. More questions? OK. Yeah, the question was about storage. Um, so uh, the way I would set this up in production, and again, if you look at the Atomic DB repo in you know, four to eight weeks, you'll actually see this, um, the, um, is to have a volume that is just in the local file system in each node. Um, and that's because I'm regarding the individual nodes and their data storage as highly disposable. Like my demo config is for people who are running this to say back a website. And for that reason, I'm assuming that the database is small enough that it's faster to PG base backup it than doing something more complicated. Um, if you had say a very large database, you might want to actually do something with persistent volumes, which is configurable under Kubernetes, where you would have it map to some form of network storage. Um, like obviously in Amazon, you'd use EBS for that. Um, map to a separate EBS volume or some other or a SAN or other network storage. And then you can actually program in Kubernetes to potentially reuse those persistent volumes for recreating the same pod. Um, there are some drawbacks to that because from my perspective, if an individual pod, if we lost an individual pod, if it failed, I don't necessarily trust the data on that pod. And I would rather create a new one because I know if I create a new one, it's going to be good. Um, and that's why, like the other, the sort of alternative configuration of Petroni is not to persist the data, but to actually restore it from a continuous backup. So let's take, actually, we're doing pretty good on time. So we'll take two more questions, I guess. So I have one more question. Yeah? Uh, I think you're on one study about the discovery region. Uh, is So the question was, do we see plans to expand Kubernetes to make it more of a data recovery solution? Um, 
I guess I'm not clear on what would be different about that. Because right now, I think uh, the code is as a VR and yeah. sync and everything is uh, a VR copyright. Yeah. So it's removed the bundle and the X sync like the version in our version. Yeah. So you have the copy of the data. Yeah. Yes. Um, well, that actually comes more from, so there's actually two different answers to that depending whether you're looking at Petroni or Flynn. In the case of Petroni, look at a lot of the optional module stuff because there's actually one of the, the example uh, modules for provisioning a new node does the thing where it actually tries to restore from, it tries to start up from the master and if it can't start up from the master, it restores from backup. And that actually would allow you to, in fact, lose all nodes and still bring the cluster back. And so if you've set up continuous backup to distributed storage, um, then you're safe. Um, Flynn has something similar that works via ZFS, exportable ZFS snapshots. Um, I don't know the Flynn code that well to explain it any further than that, but, but I know that DR is part of the solution there because they got that from Manatee, which also has something for what if I lose all three nodes. Um, so one more question. What about, uh, is there any support in, in Petroni for stunning hooks? Because one of my main concerns about this kind of solutions I already uh, talked about with, with the Zalando people is that if the old master is still alive, disconnected from the, from the CD or whatever, but still alive and connected to customers or uh, clients are connected to it, cannot still accept rights, which will be eventually lost. Right. So uh, I would need a solution to... Well, it can't actually, really but... It can't actually, but well. So your question was, um, what if the master is on an isolated network system, but some clients can still connect to it, and it's still accepting rights? Yeah. Um, and my answer is that would be a condition that would only exist for like ten seconds or less. It can exist for for that amount of time. Mm -hmm. I mean, the the polling interval is is configurable, and the lock interval is configurable. But it's a very temporary circumstance. But that is why I said, particularly with Petroni, is that it is a high availability, but not necessarily a 100% consistent solution. Yeah. So if there would be a hook to say, you know, whenever on my system I can do an API call to EC2 or Kubernetes or just a hardware switch to turn off Stonity's node, that would be safe. Um, so the question was if there was a way that you could call to turn off that node. Yeah. Well, I mean, the first thing is the built-in Petroni functionality is if it can't reach a valid ETCD cluster, because it can't reach the rest of ETCD, if it can't reach a valid ETCD cluster, then it's going to restart in read-only mode. Um, it would be possible to add that as a configuration option that says it doesn't restart, it shuts down. Um, the, um, nobody's asked for that. Wouldn't be that hard code-wise. Um, the... Um, and then the second answer you know, that I would have is if 10 seconds of incoherence is a real problem for your use case, that is 10 seconds of potentially lost rights is a real problem for your use case, then that would be a reason to look at Flynn instead of Petroni. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why I presented it as an alternative solution because these are sort of two forks of am I going to emphasize scalability and availability or am I going to emphasize data consistency? Yeah. The connection may still be kept open for more than 10 seconds. Even. I mean, as long as the server is alive, there might be a chance that a client is still talking to it. Well, because that would be a really wonky network thing. We should discuss this later on over beers where we can actually draw this out. <laughs> yep, thank you. Oh. And come to PGCon Silicon Valley, submit papers. Uh, in November. I'm, I'm head of the conference content committee, so, and we will have lots of scalable Postgres in the cloud stuff at the conference. <laughs>